let's start. So it's um, half past one. It's time for the first afternoon session. Okay, and um, uh, we will start with the work by Bukit Sinha on proper and improper quantum pack running. So please. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. So I'll be presenting a work on proper versus improper quantum back learning. So let's start with a simple device characterization scenario. So say you're given a device with N ions in the ground state, then you hit it with a photon and then observe that the photon has interacted with the device in such a way that exactly one of the ions got excited. However, you do not know which one. So it could be this one, this one, this one, or in fact, uh, the resultant state can also be a superposition over, over these singly excited states. Now, suppose you're given further the information that there's actually only a subset of size k of these ions that's actually excitable. Further, you are also given the information that the photon interacts with the device in such a way that, you, uh, that the resultant state is a uniform superposition over all the possible singly excited states. The goal now is to learn via these samples, uh, via the via samples of this resultant state, the set of excitable ions. So let's look at what the resultant state is going to look like. So the resultant state is going to look like a superposition over these ket e sub i's, where e, each e sub i is a one hot vector, where a one corresponds to an excited state, while a zero corresponds to the ion being in the ground state. Now. Information theoretically, learning from these samples is equivalent to something that is called the quantum coupon collector problem, where instead of the ket E sub i's, you are given access to superposition over uh, the ket i's belonging to S. Now, originally, this problem was studied uh, uh, due to its relation to this other learning problem called quantum pack learning. So let's look at what that is. So let's look at a more general kind of superposition, but we are still restricted to uh, amplitudes being positive real numbers. Here, the state ket psi is a superposition over the elements in a set X. Next, we consider labeled quantum samples for a function f, which is, uh, which is uh, defined on a domain X and has output 0 and 1. Now, how do these labeled quantum samples look like? Basically, in ket psi, what you do is you replace each ket i with a ket i ket f i. Notice that this uh, called labeled quantum sample is defined is well defined for uh, every binary function f. However, we are mainly interested in the case where this f belongs to unknown function class, say c. With this, the problem of quantum pack learning is as follows. So given access to these uh, quantum samples, what you're supposed to do is find uh, an approximation f tilde to f such that the corresponded the corresponding labeled quantum samples are close to each other. That is, their inner product is at least one minus epsilon. So classically, this problem has been well studied. That is, if you restrict to computational basis measurements, then it is known that the number of samples required for this problem, that is its sample complexity, is order of d over epsilon, where d is a combinatorial parameter of the function class C, which is known as the BC dimension. In 2018, it, uh, this result was extended, extended to the quantum case. That is, it was shown that even with arbitrary quantum measurements, you cannot do better than, better than uh, order D over epsilon. Now, there is one thing peculiar about the algorithm that gives us the upper bound here. The known algorithm is improper. That is, the algorithm might output an F tilde that does not even belong to the same function class. This is bizarre because the algorithm knows, uh, uses the fact that F belongs to some function class. Uh, and in fact, it uses it to perform better, but however, still outputs an F tilde that it knows can never actually be the same as F. So let's look at this peculiarity in a, in a bit more detail. So if you now uh, enforce uh, the algorithm to output an F tilde within the same function class, then that problem becomes the problem of proper quantum back learning. Now, actually, classically, it has been shown that this problem is strictly harder than the usual quantum back learning for certain function classes C. That is, uh, for certain function classes C, with just computational basis measurements, uh, the sample complexity has an order 
uh, log one over epsilon extra factor required. Now, this the lower bound for this is proven via something called the classical coupon collector problem, which is equivalent to using computational basin measurements in the original in the quantum coupon collector problem I just described. So the quantum, the classical coupon collector problem has a lower bound of k log k. Now, if we were able to find the same lower bound for the uh, quantum coupon collector problem, then we would have also got the same proper learning uh, lower bound in the quantum case as well. However, in 2020, it was shown that if the size of the complement uh, is small, then actually quantum there's a uh, there's a much faster algorithm for quantum coupon collector with arbitrary quantum measurements. Uh, so I'll not talk about, I'll not talk about our improvements. So for the for this algorithm, we showed an we showed an improved algorithm which further reduces the constant factor down to one. Now why is this interesting? We recently showed uh, the same lower bound up to lower order terms. That is, we have now characterized the sample complexity of this problem, not up to constant factors, but in fact, up to lower order terms. Such characterizations are like usually hard to find. Finally, uh, this doesn't really solve the problem of proper versus improper back learning, uh, quantum back learning either. So for that, we introduced a variant of quantum coupon collector problem, which we term as the quantum padded coupon collector problem. And for this problem, we show that the same, the classical lower bound also holds that, uh, that is the sample complexity is of order k log k. Uh, we also show that this lower bound does lead to the quantum uh, proper quantum pack learning lower bound that we wanted. So having described the results, let's first look at the algorithm. So for that, I'll first have to describe what the original algorithm did. So we are only interested in the regime where the size of the complement is small because that's where the speed up is. Uh, next, consider the state psi to be the superposition, the uniform superposition over all the possible uh, elements that uh, we are just working with the set n here. Now with this psi, we have uh, that we have that if you take the quantum sample for s and then you project it onto the orthogonal subspace of this ket psi, then approximately up to normalization, what you get is actually the quantum sample for the complement of S. Now, if this were exact, that is you exactly got the quantum sample for S complement uh, up to normalization, then you basically generated quantum samples of the complement, and then you can simply solve the coupon, quantum coupon collector problem on the complement instead, which is like very small. So it's faster to do. However, since this is not exact, if you try to use computational basin measurements on the quantum, on this uh, approximate state, you will uh, definitely get at some point of time uh, elements that belong to S instead. So the way the authors got around this was to just say, okay, uh, when you sample these, just, just only consider the elements that are above certain frequency threshold and that just works out. However, this incurs a penalty of factor 10. So to get around this, uh, our algorithm has two main ideas. First, instead of sampling uh, the complement with replacement, we sample it without replacement. This we do by, uh, by considering the complement under a smaller set instead of the whole set. Next, since uh, this doesn't really fix the problem of proxim uh, the quantum samples being approximate. So we find a way to fix previously incorrectly sampled uh, elements in further stages. So pictorially, you have the following scenario. So this entire rectangle is the set N of the first N natural numbers. Then the left, the rectangle on the left side is the set S. And so definitely the remaining one is S complement. And the blue region is kind of like the set you currently believe to belong to the complement, right? So now again, since you're making mistakes, uh, there's, there's, there's gonna be mistakes in this as well. So uh, there might be a small region, which we are referring to R, that might have an intersection with S. Apart from that, there are some elements you, you just don't know belong to this blue region, to the complement. So those are in the red region as well. Uh, so this R we refer to as the rogue elements, which uh, we have sampled so far, but actually lie in S, but we think they lie, they lie in the S complement. Well, C are elements we haven't seen at all so far. 
So having described this, let's, let's look at the algorithm in a bit more detail. Uh, so the algorithm starts with uh, the entire thing being in the red region and the blue region being like very small. So in each iteration, you ask for a quantum sample, and then you ask whether it belongs to the red region or the blue region. Okay. So if it belongs to the blue region, then uh, your base, that's basically a projective measurement. Then you have restricted yourselves to the intersection of S and the blue region. That is now you have a quantum sample for the region R. So if you just sample it, you'll figure out, okay, this is an element I'm uh, incorrectly sampled earlier. Uh, the, the other possibility is that you measure, uh, you measure it to be in the red region. So if you measure it to be in the red region, then all you need to do is take the complement of S with respect to this U, which you do via a projective measurement. And if the projective measurement goes through, then you approximately have a quantum sample for uh, the set C, which almost always is going to give you an element in set C. So that is basically the algorithm. Uh, now we move over to the variant of the uh, coupon collector problem we described, which is uh, which we termed as the quantum coupon quantum padded coupon collector. Uh, so the reason for defining this problem was that we wanted a problem that does give us the proper back learning lower bound, but does not exhibit the same quantum speed up that uh, that shows up in the quantum coupon collector problem. So one of the key reasons uh, for why the uh, quantum speed up shows up in the quantum coupon collector problem is that all the possible quantum samples uh, are actually close to one common single pure state. So to get around this behavior, we want our problem to have an adversarial scenario where some states can possibly be far apart. So the way we do that is by labeling each of the elements arbitrarily. So given on the screen here is a quantum sample for the original quantum coupon collector problem. We modified by appending a, a ket li for corresponding to each ket i. This, uh, where l is a function from the set of n natural numbers to the set of first p natural numbers, which we refer to as the padding function, and each li we refer to as, we, we refer to as the padding. Now, uh, once I've defined these quantum samples, uh, the problem of quantum padded coupon collector is now just trying to learn s with instead of the original quantum samples, but we, uh, not with the original quantum samples, but these quantum samples. Uh, now, before moving on to an overview of the uh, lower bound, I, I just want to point out one thing. So if L is injective, and if you do not touch uh, the register containing the padding, then effectively you're tracing out that register. And since L is injective, that basically implies you're decohering the entire superposition. So it reduces to basically the classical uh, sample. That is one of one of the other reasons why we consider these kind of samples. Uh, now, moving on to the lower bound overview. Uh, so, what we want to do is show that the same the lower bound for the classical coupon collector problem also holds here. So that is what we try to compare it to. So, uh, as is usual, we consider for the lower bound we consider an adversarial distribution over the input. Uh, here, so we just choose the subset S and L uniformly randomly. Now, note that in the quantum padded coupon collector problem, you're not really supposed to find L. So what you can do is you can just uh, take the ensemble average over L to get rho sub S, where rho sub S is just the ensemble average over T quantum samples corresponding to all different S's, all, all different L's for, for a fixed S. Now, with these rho sub S's, the problem of quantum padded coupon collector the problem of quantum padded coupon collector is simply just state distribution. Uh, next, we found that uh, if you apply the Fourier transform onto each of the padding registers, then the result, then the state that you get is block diagonalized. Moreover, we found that uh, the state, the blocks themselves were defined by something called the modular signature. That is, uh, basis states belonging to the same block have the same uh, modular signature. Further, we found that the support of this modular uh, signature, uh, like support in the sense, uh, so modular signature is like a sequence of elements and the support is the set of uh, indices where it's non-zero. Non so we found that that kind of counts as a proxy for a set of elements that have been collected in the classical Gubern collector process. 
So what do what do I mean by that? So uh, for any block, uh, for any non-zero block belonging to rho sub s, the probability of sampling that block, uh, sorry, uh, uh, for that block, the support uh, is always a subset of s. Next, the probability of sampling that uh, that block, uh, not just that block, but uh, overall sampling blocks uh, that have support some fixed subset s, uh, that is approximately equal to the probability of sampling is in the classical coupon collector problem. Finally, we also found that uh, the blocks corresponding, so non-zero blocks corresponding to the same modular signature, but across different S's, they are basically indistinguishable. So that basically says uh, finding the, like measuring the modular signature is basically all you can do to distinguish these states. So that's basically end of the lower bound overview and we are near the end of our talk. So to summarize, uh, we have demonstrated improved and adaptive algorithm for quantum coupon collector. For comparison, the original algorithm uh, was sequential uh, and non-adaptive. Uh, ours are still sequential, but we have an adaptive element now. Next, we introduced the quantum padded coupon collector problem, which has helped us show the proper quantum back learning lower bound. Uh, something I did not mention here is that you actually need an approximation version of this quantum padded coupon collector to show the lower bound for arbitrary VC dimension. If you just go use this version, you'll just get the lower bound for the VC dimension one case, so two case. Uh, next, uh, the specific uh, function classes for which we show the lower bound uh, are the padded function classes, which are something which we refer to as the padded function classes. Uh, finally, so, the function classes that we show the uh, the lower bound for is actually a much uh, smaller uh, subset uh, than what is known classically. Now, recently, it was actually characterized for exactly which function classes show the separation of proper and improper learning. However, this separation is still like this characterization of exactly which function classes show the separation is open. So that is the end of the talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for thank you. Okay, thank you for your interesting talk. So we have some time for questions. Hey, thanks for your talk. Is there any connection between the way you define this padded coupon collector problem and the hidden subgroup problem? Like you measure the second register, then you apply the Fourier transform, and then you do something. Based uh, on that. This, none that I actually know of, but this was also pointed out by one of the reviews, so I'm not exactly sure what's happening here. <laughs> I see. Thanks. Any, any other questions? I, I have a couple of questions myself. So uh, the first question is, um, so I don't really often see that you characterize complexity up to a constant, like, uh, not up to a constant factor, but including the constant factor. So um, I didn't really understand, was it important to, for applications or you did it just because you could did it? I mean, kind of both like, for like practical purposes, although this is like a toy model, but like for practical purposes, I just like, uh, like constant factors do matter for data, right? And for theoretical, yeah, this, this is just a way to showcase that our techniques are actually very tight. Okay, thank you. And the, my second question would be, so do you think that um, this, your technique of uh, adding extra padding can be used for some other problems beyond coupon learning? Would it be interesting? Uh, I mean, I do think so. So basically these, so if you add these padding in the classical case, that doesn't really uh, impact hardness in any way because you can just get it. However, in the quantum case, uh, uh, we do see that the padding effectively sort of decoheres the samples. So it might be useful in other cases where you want to like uh, work with quantum representations of classical data and want to show hardness results. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, so maybe any other questions from the audience? Okay, if no more questions, then let's thank the speaker once more.